Hello and welcome to today's Grand Incident. Sequels. They're strongly desired for some series, and an inevitability for others. For video games, sequels often follow the same genre and style of its predecessor, but it's not like this is always the case. Sometimes a follow-up tries something new, to mixed results, oftentimes becoming something of a black sheep within the franchise. Then there are the times when a game is pretty rough around the edges, and the sequel polishes it up to the point where it becomes widely regarded as the prime entry point into the series. These are just a few examples, of course, and regardless of how you feel about sequels, I doubt many people would complain about getting more of a game they loved. At least until it releases and royally flops. Fan games aren't exempt from sequel fever, and as it happens, one of my favorite tall fan games was exposed to it. But what kind of a sequel was it? That's what I wanted to talk about today. One of the most well-known follow-ups to any Toa fan game to date. The game known as Komajo Densetsu 2, Stranger's Requiem, or more commonly known in the West, Tohovania 2. The game was released on December 30th, 2010 by Dojin Circle Frontier Aja, and is a traditional Castlevania style game, much like the group's previous title. Only this time you play as the perfect and elegant maid, Izayoi Sakuya, now, before I get into the game, there's a few things I want to mention. Settings and such are the same as last game, with the ability to customize life count, change controls, and adjust difficulty. This time around though, the different difficulties do more than just change the amount of damage you give and take. Hard mode now also changes elements of the stage and boss fights, with more or stronger enemies, and additional bullets to boss patterns. Once again, I'll be playing on hard mode, so everything I'll be talking about will apply there but not necessarily to the lower difficulties. The other thing I'd like to mention is something this game is rather well known for, and that is that it's actually fully voice acted. Unfortunately, you won't really be hearing it in this video. So in its place, I thought it would be neat to introduce each character's voice actress as they appear, along with a few notable roles they've had, just in case you don't recognize the name, but do recognize the character. With all that said, time to start the game. The story begins introducing the main character, the maid of the Scarlet Devil Mansion, Izayoi Sakuya, voiced by Sawashiro Miyuki. Some notable roles include Shinku from Rose and Maiden, Asada Shino, or Sinon, from Sword Art Online, Kanbaru Suruga from Bakumanagatari, Robin from the Fire Emblem series, and Kami from Street Fighter. Sakuya returns from an errand to find no one's home. Shortly after, she hears a voice out of nowhere, and afterwards, the origin of the voice makes its presence known. The Yokai of Boundaries, Yakumo Yukari, voiced by Endo Aya. Some notable roles include Cheryl Nome from Macross F, Takara Miyuki from Lucky Star, the Sword Maiden from Goblin Slayer, and Karen from Street Fighter. Yukari ends up giving Sakuya some idea as to where her mistress is, then leaves, and Sakuya heads out to find her. This time around, each stage has a prep screen where you can bring up to three sub-weapons, but right now you only have knives and the stopwatch. Using these is the same as last game. You can swap between them and use them at the cost of souls, which are dropped from enemies and objects. And in hard mode, most sub-weapons cost more. Now, for Sakuya herself. She wields a knife instead of a whip, and can't do a sly kick. However, she does have plenty of other moves. Sakuya can do a dive kick out of the air that lets you bounce off enemies and objects, a backstep with invincibility, and a retreating leap that throws two knives. Bosses tend to be where you'll make use of your backstep, but the invincibility isn't that long, and it's annoyingly common to dodge onto a bullet and get hit anyways. As for the knife throw, I don't really know. I just consider it the coolest looking miss input you can make. She can also aim her knife downwards in the air to hit grounded targets from higher up. Her final move is a flurry of slashes that, while weak, do hit multiple times and are effective at breaking projectiles. You can also move while this attack is happening. Excluding the standard attack, all these moves cost stamina, which is the blue bar located under your health bar. If you don't have enough stamina, you can't use them. That's not the only use for stamina though, as flying returns in the game, 
And now, instead of being infinite with angry red orbs looming above, it drains stamina. Aside from sub-weapons, the only attack you can do while flying is the flurry, so you can't really cheese anything by flying for free. When you run out of stamina, you fall. But other than that, flying mechanics work exactly the same as last time. To refresh on what those are, you get a smaller hitbox, can break a fall by flying, and can't fly again until you touch the ground when hit while flying. Speaking of the previous game, how the gameplay works is also the same. Eight stages with bosses. A game over makes you restart the stage, and you can exit and continue to bring your lives back to whatever you started with. Stages have breakable pots that contain food that heals different amounts, and bundles of souls, and each stage has a hidden one up. This game has a number of invisible spots that need to be hit that hide these two now, and most of the one-ups are found in these. This time around, I'm not going to go crazy with the details, but I will be showing the locations of the one-ups in the footage. This also means I won't be giving a play-by-play -play and strategy for every boss attack. Anyways, stage 1 is a forest, and while it isn't anything too crazy, it does offer plenty of chances to get used to Sakuya's abilities. Old enemies return, and some new ones that fit the stage's theme show up. At the end of the stage, Sakuya reaches the gate leading to the Scarlet Devil Castle from the previous incident, and while it should be in ruin, the castle stands, having been completely rebuilt. At the gate, Sakuya finds someone tied and gagged. The gatekeeper of Scarlet Devil Mansion, Hong Mei Ling, voiced by Sato Satomi. Some notable roles include Tai Nakaritsu from k -On, Wendy Marvel from Fairy Tale, Chitanda Eru from Hyoka, Korin from the Fire Emblem series, and Rune from Azure Lane. While Sakuya tries to decipher what Mei Ling is trying to say, another person flies in. The Seven Colored Puppeteer, Alice Margatroyd, voiced by Tomatsu Haruka. Some notable roles include Yuki Asuna from Sword Art Online and Lala Satalin Devoluk from To Love Ru. Sakuya accuses Alice of being responsible for Mei Ling's situation, and in typical Toho fashion, it immediately leads to a fight. Bosses work the same way as before, in that they go through their attacks and finish with a spell card. Then the attack pattern loops. For Alice, it's a circle of bullets, then her spell card summons dolls that orbit around her and shoot. The dolls are easily destroyed, and bullet density in general is low. You also have a very large arena to work with. Once Alice goes down, she'll provide her alibi, and Mei Ling will reveal the truth of the situation. Then Mei Ling will join Sakuya as a new sub-weapon. Stage 2 takes place in the castle, because where else would it be after where that last stage ended? Now that Mei Ling is here, you'll have access to three different sub-weapons at a time. But I haven't even explained those yet. The knives are standard. You throw one at a time while airborne, and three while on the ground. They have decent range, and are relatively weak. The stopwatch stops time for three seconds. However, not everything in the game is affected by it, and all on-screen hitboxes are still considered active. Using Mei Ling has Sakuya call on her to do a rising jump kick, followed by a dive kick. There's a few more sub-weapons later, and I'll explain them as they come up. And if you're familiar with the Castlevania series, you'll probably recognize what each sub-weapon here is based on from there. Back to the stage itself, it actually has a very nice array of variety, and I mean that both in terms of level design and enemies. There's still some long corridors and stairwells, but each one has something different to help them stand out. My personal favorite is the corridor where you have to run from the Iron Cyclops. You can't kill it, but hitting its eye pushes it back, all the while having to press forward through the obstacles. That might not sound like much on its own, but as each section features something about it that sticks out, putting it all together makes for a generally memorable level, and stage 2 certainly isn't the only stage that's like this. Moving on to the boss though, Sakuya encounters a roadblock, a Shikigami. But not just any Shikigami, a Shikigami of a Shikigami. But not just any Shikigami of a Shikigami, the Shikigami of the Shikigami of the Gap Yokai, Chen, voiced by Shintani Ryoko. Some notable roles include Sai from Hidamari Sketch and Fujiyama Konomi from Nan Nan Biori. Chen's arena still leaves a lot of room to move around in, 
but Chen herself moves around it a lot. She shoots some groups of bullets at your position and spews during others. The bullets do as much as anything else, but getting tackled by Chen hurts a lot. It's intimidating to approach, and playing cat and mouse with her can really test one's patience. But she does leave herself fairly vulnerable after attacks, provided you're close enough to her after dodging. Stage 3 takes place in the Catacombs, a staple location in Castlevania games for sure, but one that's new to Toalvania. The stage begins in the basement and descends further down. It's grimy and rugged, exactly what you'd expect from this type of stage. And further in, there's water. Water slows your movement down and makes your jump go quite high. And the best part is that you don't need to find any relics to avoid taking damage in it. You may be able to dodge that one, but at the end of the level, you'll still have to take a ride on the ferryman's boat. Or I guess in this case, fairy woman. The guide of the Sanzu River, Onozuka Komachi, who's also voiced by Tomatsu Haruka. Some more notable roles include Zero Two from Darling in the Bronx and Okumura Haru from Persona 5. As you'd expect, this is an auto scroller of sorts. You'll have to wait on the boat while Komachi ferries you across, all the while avoiding the enemies trying to knock you off. As far as a section goes, it's not anything overly difficult, and Komachi doesn't have anything to do with the game outside this area, but it's a perfect scenario to use her in, so I fully understand why she's here to help. After crossing the river, you'll enter the boss room. Much like Chen, someone's here to stop you from advancing. The half-human, half-phantom gardener, Kompaku Yomu, voiced by Hirohashi Ryo. So some notable roles include Luna from Sailor Moon, Minata Minoru from My Hero Academia, Fujibayashi Kyo from Clonad, and Tails from the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Yomu slashes a lot, and bullets come out of where she slashed. She also loves to move while slashing, and the arena is a cramped cave with enough water on the ground to slow movement speed. The slashes do the most damage, and her spell card is kind of dependent on your distance from her. I think. I also don't know what affects how high she decides to fly. Yomu does have an interesting weakness though. Hitting the white orb floating around her deals more damage, and can't be hit at the same time as Yomu. Its movement is consistent, but when you hit it, it shoots out bullets, which makes things harder to dodge than they already were. Honestly, I don't really know how to fight this boss properly. The arena is cramped and the boss weakness feels like it hurts you more than it helps. Maybe I'm just missing something here but I didn't have nearly as much trouble with other bosses as I did against Yomu. Stage 4 is a return to the library, and this time it's much better. The library stage from the first game was a bunch of incredibly similar rooms that dragged on. Here though, not only is the level much shorter, but there's a bit more variety in the layout. Some sections require you to push bookcases out of your way to progress. Admittedly, it looks really unnatural, but I'd still consider it an upgrade. Other than that though, not much really changed. I think the main reason I appreciate this stage is because of my time with the last one, but if you didn't play the first game, I wouldn't be surprised if you thought this stage was rather weak compared to the previous three. Well, you might still think that even if you had played it. Perhaps that's just the fate of the library level. And love it or hate it, given the scenario and characters in this game, it's an unavoidable theme. At the end of the stage, Sakuya runs into a familiar face. The unmoving great library, Patchouli Knowledge. Voiced by Rikimaru Noriko. Some notable roles include... Well, uh, actually, I'm not going to say. Why? I'll tell you when you're older. While Sakuya attempts to find out what happened to Patchouli, a rather well-known troublemaker makes herself known. The Ordinary Magician, Kirisami Marisa. Also voiced by Shintani Ryoko. Some more notable roles include Shizuki Hitomi from Madoka Magica and Sean Kwa from Soul Calibur 4. Sakuya thinks Marissa has something to do with Patchouli's injuries, and Marissa's response is just asking for a fight to start. Although, given the nature of this series, I don't think anything she could have said would have avoided this outcome. Marissa shoots stars and lasers. Like a lot of lasers and the lasers hurt a lot. After her flashy display, she'll pull out her spell card, Master Spark, 
And as she covers herself with stars, you have very little choice but to respect it. Also, it can kill you in like three hits. Sounds scary, I know, but it's handled pretty easily just by crouching. This might be the easiest fight to die on, as almost everything Marissa does deals massive damage. Getting close to hit her with your standard attack is also pretty difficult, so that extends the time you'll have to dodge. The biggest issue in this fight is with the third attack, where Marissa fires multiple sets of lasers at you. They're fast, and I can't tell if the pattern is the same every time, so it can be difficult to react in time to dodge. I found the best way to dodge it is to fly and react, but sometimes you can just crouch next to the door and no lasers will hit you. This didn't happen consistently, and I can't tell if that's because the pattern is random, or if my position at the start of the attack influenced it. Once Marissa is defeated, Sakuya will ask her to join her, to which Marissa declines. Alice makes another appearance after this, and Sakuya ends up taking her instead, along with Patchouli. Stage 5 is the arena, because every castle needs one. This arena is a significant improvement over the last games too, as most of this stage is enemy gauntlets instead of descending staircases. Most of the rooms are corridors that are set up in a way to simulate multiple rooms to fight groups one at a time and allow for retreat. At least that's what I'm choosing to believe was the intention. In practice, a lot of the enemies can be baited, then beaten up through the wall virtually risk-free. This stage is simple in idea, but it's pretty close to what I think of when I hear arena. Putting that aside, the stage is set up in a way that lets you test out the two new sub-weapons you just got. Alice will summon four dolls that run along the floor and explode when they come in contact with something. They don't do much damage on their own, but together it adds up. Patchouli summons a magic circle around you for a few seconds, and it deals damage to everything it comes in contact with, making it great for blocking projectiles. Both sub-weapons have their uses throughout the stage, but Alice is just a bit better for dealing with the boss. At the end of the arena, Sakuya is greeted by a shadowy figure in a rather familiar fashion. Who's that sitting up on that chair? It's none other than the Shrine Maiden of Paradise. Hakure Reimu, voiced by Sato Rina. Some notable roles include Sailor Mars from Sailor Moon, Misaka Mikoto from A Certain Scientific Railgun, Nijima Makoto from Persona 5, and Vert from the Hyperdimension Neptunia series. Reimu's attacks utilize her moveset from the first Toovania. She'll whip and slide kick while firing bunches of homing amulets. Of course, she still uses Reimu things, like Ying Yang orbs and the ever-classic Fantasy Seal. As most of the bullets are homing shots, the trick to the fight is misdirection. You are more likely to take damage by bumping into Reimu rather than getting hit by her bullets, although her whip and kick deal heavy damage. I really like how this fight combines both Reimu's abilities and what she had when she was the player character from the last game. It's a unique kind of Reimu fight that could only work here. My only complaint is with her slide kick, not because it does a ton of damage, but because it does any damage at all. Certainly would have liked that last game. When Reimu is defeated, she gives up instantly and joins Sakuya while directing her to her next objective. Stage six is a clock tower. It's here a bit earlier than expected, but you knew it was coming regardless. The newest addition to the formula here is spike traps that come out of the wall. Scary, but more than manageable. Clock tower stages tend to be the source of a ton of frustration in Castlevania games. But in Toovania, a lot of those annoying elements don't really exist. There's nothing like Medusa heads constantly harassing you. The screen always scrolls with you so you don't die if you get knocked down while climbing, and the freedom of movement means no awkward jumps or enemy positions. Now this doesn't mean that this stage is simple, as the traps and enemy placements still make for a challenge. And honestly, I'd take a couple oops you died moments from those traps over just about everything else the clock tower is known for. Oh yeah, before I forget, Reimu is here now, and she shoots a yin yang orb out that comes back. It's capable of dealing a lot of damage if you have good aim. At the end of the stage, you'll find who Reimu had directed you to. The Shikigami of the Gap Yokai, Yakumo Ran, voiced by Kobayashi Yu. <laughs> Some notable roles include Sarutobi Ayame from Gintama, Sasha Blouse from Attack on Titan, Katsuragi from the Senran Kagura series, and Lucina from the Fire Emblem series. Ron shoots at you in a way that forces you to keep a distance, and this pattern goes on for a while. When she gets to her spell card, she rushes towards you, 
and creates a laser ring that's safe in the middle. And it also lasts for a while. So if you're close to Ron when she summons the ring around you, it becomes difficult to dodge it at all. Also, the lasers hurt a lot. Now having said that, this fight is arguably easier than Chen. It is entirely possible to rush Ron down and defeat her before she can even use her spell card. She doesn't move very much, and the time between attacks works against her, combined with the extra damage Reimu can get you. One of the things I like about hard mode is that you need an understanding of what a boss does and how to deal with it. As on lower difficulties, some things can just be face tanked, and you'll win in the end regardless of how reckless you were. Ron is pretty much the only boss in hard mode that you can beat this way at least, but I feel kind of bad for her that she's outranked in difficulty by Chen. Once defeated, Ron attempts to make a last stand, and is knocked down by a new, but familiar face. The sister of the devil, Flandre Scarlet, voiced by Kanemoto Hisako. Some notable roles include Sailor Mercury from Sailor Moon, Nakiri Erina from Food Wars, Squid Girl from Squid Girl, and Sakura from the Fire Emblem series. Flandre is looking for some excitement, and Reimu manages to convince her that coming along with Sakuya would be more fun. Stage 7 isn't a clock tower, but a tower nonetheless. This tower has a giant tree growing through it, so ascending it isn't as straightforward as the last stage. This is easily the longest stage in the game, and doesn't really have any instant death traps, although I do think some of the layouts make combat a bit awkward. Getting further up means going around where the tree is going, so some rooms have detours to get around, or dead ends. But most of these dead ends contain food or souls, making it somewhat worth your time trying other paths. Because the level is long, the opportunity for souls is plenty, so you're definitely encouraged to make use of your sub-weapons, especially the new one. Flandre is a screen nuke. Nothing can escape her lasers. There's a trope in games where boss characters that join you often lose all the power they displayed when they were the enemy. Not Flandre though. This attack is exactly what she was hitting you with in the last game. If at any point you're having trouble, Flandre will fix it for you. Good thing you aren't allowed to have her until stage 7, huh? At the top of the tower, the likely perpetrator of this incident arrives. The ghost girl in the netherworld tower. Saiyoji Yuyuko, voiced by Shina Hekiru. Some notable roles include Shono Ami from Girls in Panzer, Celestia Ludenberg from the Danganronpa series, and a young Maria Renard from Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Yuyuko attacks with butterflies and lasers, with some of the butterflies having special properties. In fact, throughout the fight, a single red butterfly constantly follows you, and when it touches you, your health drains. This can kill you from full within a second. Any butterfly that turns red has this property to it, so this means you have to dodge everything while also staying on the move, which is pretty difficult. Or you can just ask Flandre for help, as she trivializes the entire fight. Regardless of how it's handled, when Yuko goes down, she tells you to go see what's happened to Romilia for yourself. The final stage is exactly as you'd expect. A staircase leading to the top floor, a spot with a bunch of souls, and the boss is the room next door. In the final room, sitting on her throne, wine glass in hand, is the reason Sakuya had come this far. The Scarlet Devil, Remilia Scarlet, voiced by Kitamura Eri. Some notable roles include Miki Sayaka from Madoka Magica, Adaragi Karen from Bakumanagatari, Kawashima Ami from Toradora, Yuni from Hyperdimension Neptunia, and Yuri from Street Fighter. Romilia tosses her glass and teleports down to fight. Romilia has a lot of similar attacks from the last game, but some variation to them. One attack in particular sucks, literally, and the entire fight hinges on your ability to dodge it. As if she grabs you, it not only does a ton of damage, but heals her. In hard mode, she dashes at you three times before her spell card, so it's difficult to dodge. Once Romilia goes down, Yukari steps in to buy her some time to recover. Yukari isn't much of a fight herself though. She opens gaps that fire a laser and shoots some bullets. Chen and Ron are called into the fight sometimes as well, and can be removed with a single hit. 
It's underwhelming, yes, but her goal was only to buy time, not beat you. After that fight, Bromelia is back and brimming with new power. The only thing missing is a chair to sit in. Her attacks are pretty much the same as the first fight, but amplified, which makes perfect sense considering her power-up. The hands and weird eyeball things can be destroyed, but I don't actually know what those eyeballs do. All I do know is breaking the hands stops their attacks. This fight is hard, and pretty overwhelming. You barely have any souls, so you can't really rely on your sub-weapons, especially if you fail an attempt where you use some. A lot of attacks cover a large area, and the lasers hurt a lot. The spell card in particular is nasty, as the amount of room to dodge is small. The saving grace really is she doesn't have any attacks that steal HP, and while the laser density is high, the pattern she fires them is the same, meaning as long as you know where to stand, you'll be fine every time. Once you take her down, Sakuya and Romilia will exchange some words, and the game will end itself and roll the credits. That's the end of this story, but you already knew that this isn't the end of the game. Finishing the main game unlocks two modes, Omake and Phantasm. Omake is a few extra scenarios between some characters. There's no gameplay, just story. It's here to make the most out of the voice talent, really. Phantasm is this game's extra stage. You're allowed to bring any three sub-weapons with you, with a new one in Romilia. Apparently, Sakuya and company received an invitation for a fireworks display, and returned to the castle to see it. Right away, let me explain what Romilia does. She throws her spear, and it discharges lasers. It's exactly what she did in her boss fight, and it's just as strong here. Also, for some reason, hitting Romilia after calling her makes her fire another at no cost. For the stage itself, it's kind of insane. It's a long stage with multiple bosses that's full of enhanced enemies. It is much longer than the last game's extra stage, and significantly harder. The enhanced versions of the enemies are faster and stronger. It's really easy to die if you lose control of the situation for even a second, and constantly having to retry the room you're in is frustrating, which only leads to more mistakes. Not to mention that a game over means starting over completely. The first boss is where Alice was, but Alice isn't here. Instead, the three fairies of light are here. From the left, it's Sunny Milk, Luna Child, and Star Sapphire. They have no portraits or dialogue, but are voiced. If you're curious who voices who, I left some marks on their VA's intros. Keep an eye out for them when you totally watch this video again. Each fairy makes up about a third of the total health bar, and while each attack is simple on its own, all three together can get messy. Which one you want to take out first is up to you, but I wouldn't advise starting with Luna. Next is Chen, waiting in the same room she was before. Some of her attacks are similar to her stage 2 encounter, but she moves around a lot more, and there's just more to dodge in general. If you don't know how to handle her opening attack, you're probably getting tackled. At least the arena is big, so there's plenty of room to work with. I'm sure you've already figured this out based on the name, but here you'll see just how exactly the stage goes about connecting all the different areas. Remember that at any point you can ask Romilia or Flandre for help, but if you really don't want to rely on them, I understand. That said, I highly recommend at least bringing the stopwatch, as there's a section midway into the stage that is simply awful. Spike traps and axe fairies all over while you have to climb. Getting hit by anything is almost certain death. I said before that I like how Toavania games did clock tower stages, but this one section in the phantasm stage is not included in that. The next boss is Ron, and while it is harder to get close this time, it's not that different overall. The arena is awkwardly shaped, I guess, but for the most part, you can just wail on her until she goes down. You will be forced to deal with her laser ring at least once, though. The final sections of the stage just reek of death. Climbing through all the high damage projectiles is one thing, but the fairy knights shred half your HP if they catch you. And go figure, there's almost always one waiting at the end of a room. Once you get through those last few areas, you'll be back to the staircase. And waiting in the throne room is, of course, Yukari. Except this time, she's prepared to take this seriously. She now opens with a bunch of lasers, and has some homing shots. She'll summon bullets and her shikigami, as well as making a circle of lasers. The real difficulty of this fight is the spell card. You have to dodge four waves of bullets, and you can't attack Yukari while it's happening. This fight is pretty hard, and has a lot of potential to go wrong. Most of Yukari's attacks deal heavy damage, 
and the spell card will knock you around until you figure out how to dodge it. Something I only half learned myself. I never figured out how to dodge the third wave. Reimu is very effective here as using her at the right time will remove Chen and Ron before they can attack. Overall, Yukari isn't as bad as Flandre was, but that might be more so because you're allowed to hit Yukari more often, although this time around the stage is significantly more difficult. Once Yukari goes down, a new ending will play, and everyone will enjoy the fireworks. Toavania 2 is everything you could have asked for in a sequel. It keeps the gameplay mechanics that worked so well previously, and adjusted them to fit a new character, while expanding upon them with multiple new abilities and sub-weapons to use. Pretty much everything that I thought the previous game could have improved on was improved on here, with less repetition in stages, plenty of new enemies, and a higher difficulty that does more than just change the damage you give and take. I love how the game is able to take each boss's pattern from Toho and fit them into this genre. I especially like the Reimu fight, as it's a combination of both Reimu's abilities from the series, as well as her abilities from the previous game. The art is once again done by Vampire Killer, and the new additions and designs for returning characters really nails the style that Castlevania is known for, all the while remaining recognizable as Toho characters. The soundtrack is just as good as it was last time too, if not better, and while you couldn't really get a good listen to it here, the voice acting is superb. On that topic, you probably noticed that the voices of this game are professionals, and have been involved in way more stuff than just what I listed. Some of them have also provided voices in other Toho works, so maybe you'll recognize them there too. In short, Tohovania 2 is a perfect example of how to do a sequel. I don't even have any real complaints either. Sure, I think Ron could be harder, the library be less boring, and the Phantasm Clock Tower section didn't exist, but those are all small personal opinions. I guess the trial and error aspect of boss fights, Yukari in particular, can get annoying when you have to redo the stage after a game over. But with multiple difficulties and sub-weapons, there are ways to make things easier on yourself with each retry. Again, with Phantasm in particular, Romilia can, and will, get you through most of it with little hassle. And I don't mind Yukari that much personally, but I think that's because the trial and error aspect was infinitely worse for Flandre. Now this is the part of the video where I tell you that Frontier Aja seemingly disbanded after the release of this game. And while there's a number of reasons as to why talked about, nothing seems to have been confirmed, and I'm not interested in becoming a rumor mill. However, something I truly didn't expect to happen was an announcement that the original game, Scarlet Symphony, was getting an HD remaster, set to come out on Nintendo Switch and Steam sometime in 2021. I don't have any idea what this means for Frontier Aja itself, but in a perfect world, Scarlet Symphony is a resounding success. Stranger's Requiem follows suit, and the series starts work towards becoming a trilogy. You can call it dreaming big if you want, but Toavania 1 releasing on these platforms after 12 years already feels like a dream. It's an exciting potential future for fans of this series, and I truly hope everything goes off without a hitch. With all that said, time for the rating. Koma Jo Densetsu 2 Stranger's Requiem is much like the first, a ranked Cherno of a game. Let me explain why. Well, it's pretty much all the same reasons as before. The only things related to Toho are the characters, with all the enemies being more Castlevania than anything. Bosses once again incorporate elements of the characters' abilities well, giving an idea of their strengths. I think Sakuya does a better job at this as a playable character than Reimu did, but the sub-weapons do more for Sakuya here. One-ups are Yukuri again too, and once again, don't worry about it. Something I would say is different from before is with the character relationship aspect, but there's a reason for that. The Omake actually has a disclaimer that the content may be disrespectful of a character's image. Now, the contents of the Omake are all in good fun, so I'd hope no one would be that bothered by it. But if the developers themselves feel that way, who am I to say otherwise? The only other thing is regarding the character portraits. As I said, I think they do a good job portraying characters in the Castlevania aesthetic. But I wonder what a person would say if they played this first, then saw the official art afterwards. I don't think this is a negative in any way, but I thought someone's reaction to the contrast would be pretty funny. Would you agree or disagree? Let me know what you think. I said before that Toovania and its sequel stood out to me as some of the greatest examples as to what passionate fans are capable of for a series they enjoy. And now that I've been able to express my opinions on both games, I hope you understand why I feel that way. There's a lot to this series to enjoy for both fans of Toho and Castlevania, 
and works as a great introduction for fans of one series to the other. It's a shame that the series ended after only a second game, but with the return of Scarlet Symphony to newer platforms, I can't help but get excited for the potential future that can come from it. I very much look forward to revisiting such a classic in HD soon, and I sincerely hope that in due time, I can say the same for its sequel, or even better, get excited for an all new entry in the series. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you during the next incident.